So we can go on now with session two on the effectiveness of monetary policy. And I would like to ask the, the first speaker and the discussant to come up here and um, sit at the table. And that would be Jan Hannes Lang and Anton, Anton Anatoly Segura. So Jan is economist in our macroprudential policies division here at the ECB, and you work yeah, on macroprudential policies, um, both on, um, I think, both on borrow-based and capital-based measures, and a lot on uh, issues that are related to real estate markets. And uh, yeah, and Anatoly is economist at the Financial Stability Directorate at the Banca Italia. Welcome to the ECB. And you also work on macroprudential uh, policies, uh, stress testing, and bank resolution frameworks. So thanks very much, uh, Jan. I would give the floor to you. Uh, do we have and I the, think there's a pointer. Yeah, from that's already there. yeah, so first of all, um, thanks a lot to the conference organizers um, for inviting us. So the paper I present today is called um, The State-Dependent Impact of changes in bank capital requirements. And this is joint work with uh, Dominic Menno from the Bundesbank. So he's also here in, in the audience. So if I say something you don't like, uh, you can go to him after the talk. Um, so I think the, the paper we're presenting today actually speaks to a couple of the questions um, that were raised yesterday in the policy panel. So in particular, um, in the current environment, is it still um, possible to go ahead with tightening macroprudential buffers, that's one of the questions. And the second one is how high are the costs in general of increasing macroprudential buffers? And I think our paper provides reasonable and, and uh, intuitive answers to both of these. Um, a spoiler already, so I think uh, the key uh, message would be, in our view, you can still go ahead given high profitability of the banking sector. And also um, the costs, if you do it um, right, phasing in the higher capital requirements can actually be extremely low. So therefore, you probably want to err on the side of higher buffers in normal times than rather uh, too low buffers. So I hope uh, I caught your interest in, in our paper. And I'm going to provide you some, some more details of how we get to, to these conclusions. Um, so given that we work at central banks, uh, the usual disclaimer applies that these are our views and not those of the institutions. So for the talk today, there are um, four sections. So I will start with a brief motivation and an overview of the key results that we have. Then I will show you the structural model setup that we use uh, for our analysis. And then in section three, I will provide the key results of our model, both analytical results and uh, quantitative results. And in section four, I will provide a brief conclusion um, and sort of implications for, for policy. So what's the motivation for, for the paper? Our key motivation is really that the impact of changes in bank capital requirements seems to be state dependent. So if we look at empirical evidence, um, there's evidence that there's close to a zero impact of increasing capital requirements when you're in good states of the macroeconomy. And uh, you can reduce lending by a few percentage points if you increase requirements in bad states. And you can see this illustrated in the left-hand uh, chart. So here we summarize the findings of some key empirical papers. And you can see that basically, for example, when capital buffers are high, um, the output gap is positive, or when banks are profitable, the impact of increasing capital requirements um, is very low, so very close to zero. But if these factors are adverse, then actually um, lending is reduced quite a lot if you increase capital requirements. And the second key motivation um, for our paper um, is that actually this feature of state dependence is missing from many of the standard macro models, um, especially the ones that we use um, for policy evaluation at central banks. And you can see this um, illustrated uh, in the table on the right hand side of the chart. So we borrowed this from a recent um, ECB paper, which summarizes basically the, the quantitative implications of various DSGE models of a one percentage point increase in requirements on lending. And you can see in the first column that basically most of these models would lead to a reduction of roughly one percentage point uh, in lending for one uh, percentage point increase in, in capital requirements. So 
this is really the, the motivation for, for why we um, study state dependence um, in, in our paper. So let me walk you through sort of the key results and, and what we do in the paper. So our key result is really that there's strong state dependence and the impact of changes in bank capital requirements can differ by up to two orders of magnitude, depending on whether you're in good macrofinancial states or in bad macrofinancial states. So how do we get to these conclusions? So we build um, a structural nonlinear banking sector model, and there are a few key ingredients. So we have monopolistic uh, competition, but that's actually um, not crucial to derive the results, but it helps in some of the modeling. But we assume that bank equity is always more costly than debt. So this is actually an assumption that makes it or tends to make it actually hard for um, increasing capital requirements to have low costs. But even with that conservative assumption, we, we derive the results um, that I will show you. And then within that framework, we add two occasionally binding constraints. So the first one is a potentially time varying capital requirement. And the second one is um, that banks cannot issue equity. So they can only increase um, equity through retaining earnings. So this is actually also um, a standard or, or um, an assumption that is uh, done quite often in, in macro models. And what we show is that the interaction of these two occasionally binding constraints really um, um, introduces this very strong state dependence of the impact of changes in bank capital requirements. So when banks are in normal states, and we um, basically term something as normal when banks hold voluntary capital buffers and they make positive profits so that they could actually uh, cope with uh, moderate capital requirement increases. So when banks are in normal states, the impact of uh, increasing capital requirements is actually extremely low. So it's um, roughly minus 1% uh, in loans for one percentage point increase in capital requirements. And what we show is that the impact can even be lower than this. However, if you're in bad macrofinancial states, so meaning states where banks don't have voluntary, uh, voluntary capital buffers or very low voluntary capital buffers, and where they make big losses, the impact of changes in capital requirements can be extremely large. So we show that the impact can be up to 10 percentage point more loans if you are able to release capital requirements by one percentage point in these um, states of the world. And let me quickly illustrate sort of the intuition behind these results, because, because I think it helps a lot um, to understand the, the more technical results that we'll, we present later. So in normal states, when banks have voluntary capital buffers and are profitable, something that we call a pricing channel is, is present. So banks have the equity to fulfill higher capital requirements, but because equity is more costly than debt, the funding cost um, of loans increases. But this impact on funding costs is actually very small. So it means you only move up a little bit uh, on the loan demand curve, and the impact on, on equilibrium loan quantities is extremely small. However, if you're in, in the bad states, something is present which we dub the quantity channel. And it simply means in, in these bad states, banks are already equity constrained. So if you are able to actually change the requirement, because banks are highly leveraged, that requirement directly affects the loan quantity that banks can supply um, to the market. And therefore, basically, it, it basically means you're controlling something like a financial accelerator. And if you're able to, to basically alleviate that constraint in, in the bad states, um, you can have a big supporting impact on, on loan supply. So in the interest of time, I will actually skip um, the, the presentation of the re related literature. But in our view, the key contribution of the paper is really that we spell out clearly these two different um, state-dependent transmission channels, so pricing channel and quantity channel, and we derive some very clean analytical results regarding um, the quantitative implication of these transmission channels. So let me briefly run you through the structural model setup um, that we use. So. We assume a fairly stylized, but in our view, realistic bank balance sheet and profit and loss account. So basically on the asset side, banks hold loans. So there's only one asset um, uh, that they have and they finance that um, via deposits and uh, equity. So the first equation just shows you the, the balance sheet identity. And then the profits of the bank are defined as net interest income 
minus the cost of risk, so provisioning, and minus operating cost. So uh, in the equation, um, let me briefly explain the, the different terms. So net interest income is simply the interest rate that the bank gets on loans times the loans um, outstanding minus uh, the interest rate on deposits times deposits. And we substituted out uh, deposits by using uh, the balance sheet identity and substituting in loans uh, minus equity. Then cost of risk is simply um, we assume that a time varying fraction theta of loans default and they need to be written off uh, through the PL. And then operating costs, we simply assume that they scale up linearly um, with the size of, of the bank. So let me um, mention two important uh, aspects regarding the modeling. So the loan interest rate is endogenous in our model. So we have a monopolistic competition and we have an aggregate um, loan demand function that is downward sloping with a constant interest rate semi-elasticity. It's um, basically illustrated in the annex, but in the interest of time, I will not show the equations. But it's important to understand that basically the interest rate on loans depends on the loan choice of the bank and on the aggregate loans um, supplied in, in the economy. And then uh, the impairment rate, uh, I already mentioned, we assume that it's stochastic and time varying, and we assume it follows a log AR1 process. And the reason for assuming a log AR1 is that in the data, we have actually a fat right tail um, of, of provisioning so that um, features needed to, to mimic the data. So, um, as I mentioned, uh, we impose two occasionally binding constraints. Um, but before explaining the constraints, let me quickly explain uh, how equity is built. So banks can only build equity through retaining profits after um, dividend payouts. So what you can see is basically next period equity of the bank is equal to starting period equity plus the profits during the period minus the dividends that they pay out. And while the dividends are the choice, optimal choice of the bank, um, we assume that banks cannot issue equity. So the way we impose that occasionally binding constraint is that dividends have to be greater or equal to zero all the time. So some of you might think, okay, that's an extreme assumption um, to assume that banks cannot issue equity at all. But our reply to that would be, I mean, first, as I mentioned, it's often assumed in, in macro models. And in the annex, we also show evidence that actually banks rarely issue equity in the euro area, even when they make losses. So for unlisted banks, even in 90% of the time where they make losses, they don't issue new equity. For listed banks, it's a bit more, but even there, 50 to 70% of the time, they don't issue new equity uh, when they make losses. So in our view, it's an extreme assumption, but let's say it's a, it's a high level first pass uh, approximation. Then the second occasionally binding constraint is the potentially time varying capital requirement R. And that must be met by the banks um, at all times. So the capital ratio, which is defined as equity over risk weighted assets. So omega is our um, risk weight that we assume. Um, this must be greater or equal um, than the capital requirement all the time. So the objective of banks in our model is that they maximize the present discounted value um, of expected dividend payments. And the discount rate um, that they use is determined by the required return on equity, which we denote by rho. And we assume that rho is strictly greater than um, the, the debt funding cost of, of the bank. So we make it basically, in principle, we make it costly um, for increasing uh, capital requirements. And the decision problem of the bank can actually, so this dynamic maximization problem can be represented by the Bellman equation that you see on this slide. So basically the value function has four state variables. So you have the credit risk shock theta, loans of the bank, equity of the bank, and the aggregate um, loans in the economy, because as I mentioned, the interest rate and therefore also um, the, the payoffs depend on the aggregate loans um, in, in the economy. And what's important to note is basically the, the two occasionally binding constraints that we introduced um, in, in the second line of the equation. So the first one is the capital requirement constraint. And here we denote the associated Lagrange multiplier with chi one. And the second one is the equity issuance constraint where the Lagrange multiplier is denoted by chi two. So the equilibrium of our model is determined by the first order conditions. And after you take the first order conditions to impose 
the representative uh, bank assumption. So um, basically the idiosyncratic uh, loan choices and the aggregate uh, choices need to be uh, consistent given that we assume a unit mass um, of identical banks. So given that I've uh, presented now the, the model setup, um, let me briefly uh, run you through the key results. So we have analytical results and we have quantitative results for model that we solve with global solution methods and we calibrate it uh, to euro area data. So the first result is that there is a pricing channel of changing bank capital requirements. So proposition one states that in the absence of an equity issuance constraint, the equilibrium loans respond to changes in capital requirements by a pricing channel. So the percentage change in loans is equal to the right-hand side expression. And let me run you through the intuition behind the right-hand side and, and this pricing channel. So if you increase capital requirements, given that equity is more costly than debt, this should increase the funding cost of loans. And that's basically captured by the square brackets. So raw is or raw minus ID is simply the equity premium, and omega times delta R is the additional um, equity that you need to fund the loan. But the key insight is that actually the funding cost impact of higher requirements should be very low. So if you plug in reasonable numbers like an 8% um, uh, cost of equity, a 2% cost of debt, 50% uh, risk weight, and a one percentage point increase in requirements, that should increase your funding costs by three basis points. So we're talking about one eighth of a standard monetary policy rate hike increment. So this is actually super low. And then given that we assume monopolistic competition in the model, this increase in funding cost is passed on to borrowers with a markup. So that's why you have mu over mu minus one um, in front of that uh, funding cost increase. And the impact on equi equilibrium loan quantities then depends on how elastic loan demand is. So that's why you have the epsilon there, which is the interest semi-elasticity of loan demand. And if you look at empirical estimates, they are usually uh, estimated around three, this epsilon. So if you put basically the, the numbers together, you end up with this minus 0.1% um, decrease in, in loans for one percentage point increase in capital requirements. So these results are for the model where you don't have the equity issuance constraint, but importantly, what we show is for the full model with the issuance constraint, in states of the world where banks actually hold voluntary capital buffers before and after changing capital requirements, a similar pricing channel is active. And importantly, the impact can even be lower than this minus 0 0.1 um, on, on lending. So the key message regarding the pricing channel is really that the impact on lending is very small. And here um, we illustrate this with simulations from the full model. So what you see in the chart is on the y-axis is the decrease in loans in response to a, a increase of capital requirements from 10 to 11%. On the x-axis, you see basically the, the relative frequency of, of these impacts. And we only look at states where banks hold voluntary capital buffers before and after this increase in capital requirements. So focus first on the red bars. So if banks actually hold voluntary capital buffers, but they don't pay dividends before and after, then you get this minus 0.1% uh, drop in loans for one percentage point increase in requirements. If banks also pay dividends before and after, the impact is virtually close to zero. And that's illustrated by the, the blue bars. Um, so the impact can even be uh, much smaller than the 0 0.1 and can basically be, be almost nothing. The second key result of the paper is that there's also a quantity channel um, can be present for changing capital requirements. And this is um, illustrated with proposition two. So in states of the world where the equity issuance constraint and the requirement constraint are both binding, equilibrium loans respond to changes in requirements via this quantity channel. And the quantity channel simply states that the percentage change in loans that you get in equilibrium is equal to minus the percentage change in the capital requirement. And given that capital requirements tend to be low, so let's say 10% roughly, if you change it by one percentage point, that roughly means a 10 percentage point change in, in the requirement. So you can already see the quantity channel whenever that is present will have a big impact on, on lending. So the intuition is really that. I mean, if banks 
are equity constraints. So basically, if both constraints bind, they don't hold voluntary capital buffers, they don't pay dividends. So loans are simply determined by equity plus profits and the requirement. And equity and profits are given. And you can see from that equation, if you change the requirement, the only thing that can adjust is loans. And given the high leverage, the adjustment in loans will be very, very um, large. So changing requirements when the quantity channel is, is present can have a big impact on loan quantities. And we illustrate that also with, um, with our model. Um, so basically, the quantity channel impact on lending can be very large. And it can be basically up to 10 percentage point um, for a one percentage point uh, requirement release. And we illustrate that by shocking our model economy with a very big credit risk shock, and then comparing the um, evolution of loans for two different economies. So one where we keep the capital requirement constant at 11%, that's the red line in, in, in the charts, and one where we decrease the requirement from 11 to 10% upon the impact of, of the shock. And the shock basically is, is the same in both cases. So what are the mechanics? When the bad shock hits, banks make big losses that eat up all the voluntary capital buffers, so they're actually forced to deleverage, and you see that by the a red line in the right hand side chart so loans would need to drop by almost or by more than 12 percent to still meet the requirement given the the heavy losses um, that banks incur but if the uh, regulator is actually able to release the requirements to 10 percent this gives banks um, basically space or yeah available space to absorb losses and mitigates the deleveraging pressure so you can see um, in the right hand side chart that the blue line drops much much less so roughly nine percentage points less than the, the red line. So this illustrates um, the big impact of the quantity channel. So finally, we ask um, what kind of capital requirement rules can help you prevent that the quantity channel is present? And in proposition three, we derive such generalized rules. So policymakers can avoid the quantity channel with any time varying capital requirement rule that satisfies that the requirement never turns negative and it satisfies the following condition in all states. And this condition is fairly intuitive. So the requirement that you set for next period has to be lower than the current capital ratio of the banks, plus the return on risk-weighted assets, and the whole thing is adjusted for um, a growth rate factor. So G star is basically the desired loan growth rate of the banks in the absence of the equity issuance constraint. And what's the intuition? It's basically the return on risk-weighted assets and loan growth together give you the speed limits for how quickly banks can increase their capital ratio. So when profits are positive, a gradual buildup of the capital ratio and therefore also of the requirement is possible without constraining banks. But of course, if banks make losses, you need to release and, and reduce uh, the requirement because there's basically downward pressure on the capital ratios of banks. And to accommodate that, you need to reduce uh, the requirement. So finally, we use our quantitative model to actually implement such a simple state-dependent rule that is consistent with Proposition 3. And what you can see illustrated in the chart is basically the transition dynamics from an economy where you have a constant 10% capital requirement to an economy where basically the capital requirement is varied between 10 and 15%, depending on profitability. So when there's, uh, there are positive profits, there are gradual uh, continuous increases in the requirement. When there are losses, the requirement is reduced. And the, the blue ranges show the percentile ranges across uh, 200, uh, 100,000 simulations uh, of, of the economy. And what you can see is that there are actually big gains at rather moderate costs of such a state-dependent capital requirement rule. So after five years, if you focus on the right-hand side chart, basically the, the far right tail of uh, credit drops is gone. So credit crunch crunches or severe credit crunches are eliminated from the economy. And you do that at rather moderate costs because the average and upper percentiles of the loan growth distribution are barely affected. So they only reduce very minimally. So let me just provide a brief conclusion. So I will not recap uh, the findings, but say what we think are the policy implications. So yesterday there was already a a lot of mention of positive neutral CCYB. And in our view, the results that we derive in the paper clearly support such a macroprudential strategy.
because the cost of building buffers when banks make profits, if you do it gradually, should be very low. But at least you have something that you can release in times of stress to really give uh, banks breathing space and continue um, supplying loans uh, to the economy. Um, so yeah, how, how and when should capital requirements be increased? Just do it when banks make profits. It's easily observable. How should you do it? You should do it gradually. So speed limits are given by return on assets and, and loan growth. And this should be super easy to implement and you will impose almost no costs um, on, on lending and the economy if you do it um, in, in the simple and transparent way. When should you release capital requirements? Clearly when banking sector makes losses. So recession is not enough. If banks still make positive profits so in the current environment, profitability is very good, not time to release um, at, at the moment. How should you do it immediately and of sufficient size so banks can actually absorb the losses that, um, that they realize? But of course, this is a bit harder to implement because you have this uh, observation lag between losses um, actually being borne by the banks and then being reported. So of course, some type of preemptive release might be needed. But I'll leave it there um, in the interest of time. And thanks a lot for your attention and looking forward uh, to Anatoly's uh, discussion. Thanks, Jan. <clears throat> So thank you to the organizers for inviting me to discuss this paper. It has been a pleasure to, to read it. So let me start with a very brief uh, overview of what the paper does. So the, the authors develop a da dynamic, nonlinear equilibrium model of the banking sector in a context in which banks face two occasionally binding constraints. I mean, one arising through a regulatory minimum capital requirement, and the other one is in by assumption that banks cannot issue um, equity. And the results of the paper are that uh, the effects of changes in capital requirements are state dependent. When no, no, no of the constraints binds, then the, 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 the impact of the change in capital requirements is small. And when the both constraints bind, the impact is very large, is 100 times bigger. So this, this, the, this paper provides a very strong uh, policy message going the direction. It is good to build macro potential space when banks have ample capital headroom and they are doing uh, strong profitability. The, this comes uh, at a very low cost and has the, a very, uh, very sizable potential benefit if losses uh, uh, realized uh, later on in the future. So in my discussion, what I'm going to spend is some time in describing the, the mechanisms and, uh, and the calibrated results, and then I will do some, some comments. So the model, uh, the model this is a uh, uh, discrete time infinite horizon. You have a continuum of banks that issue one period loans that are subject to some, uh, some, uh, some risk. Some of the, the loans may, may default. There is aggregate risk and this follows and uh, there is some per persistence in this aggregate risk. And there is also a downward sloping demand for, for loans. Now, banks are funded with, with own funds, with equity that is expensive and cheaper deposits. The banks face two, two constraints. They have to satisfy a minimum capital requirement and they cannot issue equity. They can only pay dividends. So essentially the model, the way I see it, is a sort of a discrete time version of the Brunner, Meyer and Sanikov uh, AR paper with the capital requirement. So what are the mechanisms in this, in the, in this paper? So let's think before on how this economy re responds to, to shocks. And this is very much in line with what we know from, from Brunner, Meyer, and Sanikov. So when there is a very large shock in this economy, banks are going to hit their capital requirement constraint. Now, at, this po at that point, the lending supply in the economy is going to be determined by, by bank capital. So shocks, that uh, to the economy that tra translate into equity losses for banks, <clears throat> then are transmitted and amplified through the, through the funding constraint. So 
that is amplification of losses when when negative shocks are very large now banks anticipate that and they dislike hitting their uh, their uh, their constraints because they realize that when there are bad shocks <clears throat> aggregate lending supply will be constrained and interest rates will be very high so banks realize that they would be able to do a lot of profits during during crisis and that's why they want to have voluntary buffers this is a model in which banks uh, endogenously have voluntary buffers in order to, to protect themselves from the implications of aggregate shocks. Now, given that they have voluntary buffers, if there is a small negative shock, it is not going to, to deplete, in, uh, deplete entirely the, the voluntary buffer, and this shock is going to be transmitted to the economy, but it's not going to be amplified. So this is Brunner, Meyer, and Sannikov. And what the main results of the paper are is just uh, they don't look at the impact of shocks, but they look at the impact of changes in capital requirements that one might think there are a shock to the banks as well. And the, the results are new, but they are in a way a mirror image of the uh, results in Brunner, Meyer, and Sanica. So when the change in capital requirements is done when banks don't have voluntary buffers, then the capital requirement is binding, lending supply is determined by the capital requirement, and there is amplification that is amplification of the change in capital requirements. When instead uh, banks have ample voluntary buffers, the change in capital requirements is not amplified. So there is an impact, but it is very small. So this part of the paper, the analytical part of the paper, is very transparent, and uh, there are very uh, the, the analytical results are very intuitive and they're very persuasive. So let me get to the to the to my comments. My first comment is on, on how to place this paper uh, in the context of the existing literature. So there are some quantitative microfinance papers that have occasional uh, binding fi uh, financing constraints for the banks and that look at optimally uh, at the optimality of state dependent uh, policy rules. And there are some papers that, it, that are even richer in the sense that they have also firms and that are facing occasionally binding uh, uh, financing constraints. And what are, just l let me mention the, the, the two papers that come to my mind. One is one by one of my co-authors, Villagorta. And this paper, the interplay between, uh, between uh, banks and firms' balance sheets is going to generate two types of, of recessions when there are shocks. The answer to crisis, well, these are crises in which firms' balance sheets are mo most hit, and these crises ha have a very fast recovery. Then there can be also banking crises that are crises in which uh, the bank's net worth is mostly hit, and these crises have the particular feature that the, the recovery is very slow. And in that paper, uh, the Acorta looks at optimal uh, policies that uh, are not changes in capital requirements. Uh, what is uh, the optimal uh, recapitalization rules in this, in this environment? And it is also state dependent. He shows that uh, it is optimal to direct recapitalizations to the most hit sectors. There is also a paper the, by Vadim uh, Eleven and, and, and co-authors uh, published in Econometrica. It's a very rich macrofinance model calibrated for the US, and they look, the purpose of the paper is to, to look at the optimal calibration of, of capital requirements in the, in the US, and they show that uh, cyclically adjusted capital requirements, so state-dependent capital requirements, dominate fixed capital requirements. So it's important to place the, the paper uh, in the context of, of these contributions. My, 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 my second comment is that uh, the, the paper should strengthen its normative implications. So the way it is written so far, it, it has a positive approach to the analysis of capital regulation. And they look at what is the, what is the effect of changes in capital requirements, and, and the results are in line with what we knew from the from the literature of the impact of shocks in, in the presence of financial frictions. So what is missing is a normative approach. So why are capital requirements? Uh, why are there capital requirements in this economy and how to optimally set them? So I, I would give some, some suggestions for the authors to try to improve the paper in this front. So a, a natural question that came to my mind is, is the model equilibrium constraint efficient? 
if it is not constraint efficient, there would be a rationale for for policy intervention and po potentially for a capital uh, for capital requirements. So notice that in, in this model, uh, the banks' capital accumulation choices affect uh, equilibrium in the in, in the loan market. And the equilibrium in the loan market, in, in turn, affects uh, how much profits banks do during crisis, and those profits enter the uh, the financing constraint. So it's the the typical setup in which there could be pecuniary externalities. So there could be excessive excessive leverage by the financial sector, or too little. We don't know. It depends, and it would be interesting to to explore that. Then another thing is that in the model, the authors assume that deposits are insured. But, the, but still in equilibrium, they calibrate the model so that in equilibrium there is no bank default. Now, bank default and deposit insurance is the traditional motive for, for regulation of the banking sector, both in reality and in many, and in many models. So I would suggest the authors to, to allow for bank default that would give a rationale for, for uh, capital regulation in the model, and that is also realistic. And at the very least, if that is too complicated, assume a sort of uh, mean variance social preferences for bank uh, lending, so that the trade-offs between maximizing aggregate lending and minimizing volatility of lending can can be uh, studied with much uh, with a bit more of of, of of structure. Then, my last comment is that uh, I mean, in the, in the, in the authors also push for a particular state-dependent uh, uh, rule for setting capital requirements. Um, it was not presented in the in, in the presentation, but the, the way that the, the proposed rule works is for given banks capitalization, <clears throat> the capital requirement is set in order for banks to be able to accommodate average lending in the economy and still keep a buffer. So when the banks under that rule, <clears throat> When the banks suffer losses, the capital requirement is reduced, and when they when they make profits, the, the the capital requirement is increased. Now, some questions uh, that this uh, this type of proposed rule um, raises to my mind is that in the context of this model, it's not so clear that this rule would be so different from the the different from from the standard macroprudential buffers that that uh, authorities have at their disposal. For example, a countercyclical capital buffer in this economy in which there is only one source of aggregate risk and, and when <clears throat> and which is the loan impairment rate, when when the loan impairment rate is low, there are lending expansions and banks make profits. So a countercyclical capital buffer would push also towards increasing capital requirements. So the particular situation we are facing in many economies now that credit is contracting and, 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 and banks are doing a lot of profits does not arise in this model. And, uh, and this is the particular situation in which many authorities don't, don't know what to do. So I think it would be necessary to introduce some additional shock to, to, to break the, the, the equivalence between, between the, the, the two policy rules. And to conclude, and uh, an important, uh, I think the, the, the paper has the potential to speak to something we are very interested in. The, the uh, Vice President De Guindos in his uh, keynote uh, uh, dinner speech concluded with the, the reference to, 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 to the discussion between buffer releasability and buffer usability. This is a model, there are not so many models there that has endogenous capital buffers. And the, and, and the model has the potential to speak to how different are, uh, through the lens of, of macro finance models, uh, usable buffers from uh, releasable buffers. So I think this is uh, something that uh, you might want to, to explore. And, let me conclude with this. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Anatoly. So lots of uh, ideas, I think, to, to further work on the paper. We can take one or two uh, questions. And I have, uh, well, Alastair, then there was Stefan. OK, then here. But please try to be concise in your question. Uh, thank you. Very, very, very interesting. Um, but you, you can observe in the market today, 17% cost of equity being applied to, to European banks. So that it, it'd be interested how that would impact the model. And, and, and one of the things as a market participant I've observed is that, that if the central bank treats bank profits as its 
rather than as fundamentally accruing to shareholders in most cases. Shareholders apply higher and higher discount rate to, to bank earnings. So what's actually happened is the cost of equity has risen in Europe as the um, capital levels have risen because the capital's been continually diverted. So, you know, that, that 17, that uh, I'm interested in how your model would work if you increase the cost of equity as you capture the capital, which is observably what's happened, and I, I, I'd, I'd, I'd expect it would be less beneficial. Thank you. So, thanks, thanks a lot for, for that presentation. It, in a sense, it's a very regulatory you know, um, perspective on, on the banking system and, and the role. And, and I think it's great to have the distinction, you no, know, the state dependence there. But one thought I had was, what about changing over time kind of uncertainty? So what is, if you have kind of, you're in a, in a, in a, in a regime of high uncertainty and you have your, your banking system and you have your regulations in place and you expect in the future it goes down, no, the uncertainty goes down, or the, the opposite. Can you say anything now already, or is this uh, already is this a uh, next paper, so to say? I, I guess it's half a similar, uh, I will have uh, two comments. Uh, the, the first one, I think you assume that somehow the return on equity gets adjusted as the, as the requirement increases. I think in the real world, a lot of the loans are 30 year mortgages. So in reality, as you increase the requirement, the return on equity goes down and that's what's happened. You have other businesses which are not able to reprice, which are not loan based, right? So in, in practi practical terms, the return on equity goes down. As an, as an equity investor, your capital gets trapped in the business because you, you think you're getting, let's say eight or 17 or whatever you think you should be getting. But in reality, your remuneration is very, very long. And in, in the real world, the release of, of requirements doesn't work, right? Because in a crisis, nobody wants to be running, you know, if the requirement is, if the standard is 15, nobody wants to be running with 10, right? Because basically they would get destroyed by the fixed income market, A, and B, because everybody knows they will have to go back to 15, right? So in, in practical terms, nobody's willing to go down to 10, even if in te technically they could, which is what happened with, uh, with COVID, right? So the release doesn't work. In, in practical terms, it only goes up and up and up, but th there are no step backs. Thank you very much. Uh, just a question about the timing of capital requirement announcement. So you know that the CCYB is usually announced one year in advance. So I'm, I was wondering whether uh, a timeliness or an unexpected announcements would change the impact of capital requirements. And do ba ba would banks price in these early, or would it give a like a, a mitigated amount on impact? And how does the level of competition or concentration uh, impacts your results? Thank you. Thanks very much. So please, uh, floor is yours. Thanks a lot for the discussion have. and also for the for the interesting questions. Um, now, I think you, you did a really good summary of, of the paper, and, and indeed, I think Bonamaya Zanikov is closely related, and um, we really see our contribution in focusing on the capital requirement and clearly spelling out the state-dependent transmission channels of, of changes in requirements. So, indeed, I mean, the modeling framework itself is not entirely new, but I think um, the perspective of how we use it um, adds valuable insights, especially for, for the policy debate. So, I mean, your, your first related comment would be, yeah, placing it um, in, into the literature and there I fully agree um, we, we can still do a better job to, to clearly um, specify what we do differently and, and what we focus on differently. In terms of sort of more normative implications, um, these are definitely um, valuable suggestions and we thought of some of them. And I mean, we need to see what's actually um, realistic to model um, because one of the key strengths of our current paper, at least as we see it, is that we're actually able to derive very clear analytical results. And in our view, that actually helps a lot to have a transparent debate if you don't always need to resort to numerical uh, solutions. So we, we will explore what we can actually add and still stay within, let's say, a, a clean and neat, neat framework. Um, 
then on maybe on your final comment on, on the relation to the existing CC by B routes, there I actually disagree because exist, in my view, existing CC by B road, rules depend on a measure of cyclical risk. So you need to first estimate something that is unobservable. Our proposed rule is only based on observable variables, capital ratio and profits, and it's a completely different approach. You basically say, don't care about risks, because if you increase gradually and slowly and predictably uh, capital requirements when times are good, the costs are very low, so you don't really, I mean, you, you want to err on the side of caution because you don't do much harm by having, let's say, one or two percentage points buffer in addition. And I think, therefore, this, this type of rule deviates quite a lot from sort of this risk-based perspective where you say, no, no, it's really costly to increase requirements, and therefore, you really want to be sure that you need them for high risks. But in my view, this type of approach has not really proven that impactful and effective in reality. Um, uh, yeah, some of uh, uh, people who have seen um, David's talk yesterday would speak also in, in, in that direction. Then, I mean, regarding the, the questions, so yeah, indeed, I mean, uh, cost of equity estimates have, have gone up. Also, the cost of debt has gone up. So what really matters in the model is the difference between the two, because that's basically the additional cost that you impose on banks. Of course, if you assume that this so if the equity premium goes up, this will increase the pricing channel impact. But even if you increase that by 50%, the equity premium, your three basis point um, funding cost impact will go to 4.5. So in my view, of course, it will have an impact. It will make it more costly, but it will not lead to a different order of magnitude compared to what we have shown. And then actually, in, I mean, my view would be the following. What, what we actually show here is that being simple and transparent, and it's not that we're taking away profits from banks, the equity is, stays in banks. And even with our rule, we basically ensure always that banks can pay dividends, even in crisis times, because the release will always be bigger than actually what, um, what, the, what the hit to, to bank capital ratios would be. So the rule we implement in the model allows banks basically to continuously pay out um, dividends. Uh, we, we simply, um, is, impose that they gradually need to increase requirements uh, ratios when, when times are good. On Stefan's question regarding un uncertainty, I don't really have a good, good answer. I um, haven't, haven't thought about uh, that part. Um, th there was a question on, on potential ineffectiveness of, of release in, in times of stress. So I think, so I didn't mention it here, but I think what's important to keep in mind that what I've shown you only works if the market imposed leverage limit or capital requirement is below what the regulator says, sets. So of course, if let's say in good times, your requirement is not high enough so that actually the losses that banks incur in bad times would force the regulator to reduce capital requirements below a market imposed capital requirement, then no effect of release. There, yeah, I fully agree. The flip side of that is, in the good times, you need to increase the requirement way above what's market imposed so that in bad times, you can reduce the requirement sufficiently that you're still above a market imposed leverage um, requirement. On, final question on timing. So in our model, um, the CCYB or the requirement is uh, announced one period in advance. And actually what, what it does is, given that banks anticipate this, and if you have a clear rule, it actually will lead to lower voluntary buffers because there's less self-insurance mechanism in the model because the, the regulator basically takes, um, takes out the, the insurance motive to, to some extent because um, they, they reduce the requirements. Okay, I'll leave it there. Thanks very much, Jan. So I saw a number of hands still up, so maybe you can use the coffee break, which will start now. I would like to thank the presenter and the discussant very much, and then we resume at 11.15.